My name is Emily, and I'm 43 years old. I've been married for 21 years, and I have a 20-year-old son. My husband's name is Robert, and he's 55. I work from home these days. I've loved this family for 20 years, or at least I thought I was happy. I want to share the story of how I almost lost it all. I grew up in a foster home since I was one. By the time I was aware of my surroundings, Elisa, the director of the children's home, was like a mother to me. Two years older than me, we were like siblings. Rayanne and Olivia, twins, they also came to the foster home around the same time I did. Their parents had died in an accident. Thanks to them and Elisa, I had a relatively smooth childhood in the foster home. But when Ryan and Olivia turned 17, they were adopted by relatives and left the home. For the first time in my life, I felt a crushing sadness. At 15, I couldn't cope with the loss. I started to act out. As the people around me became increasingly cruel, I began sneaking out to the city at night to vent my frustrations. Even when I was detained for being a minor and Elisa came to pick me up from the police station, I acted like I didn't care about her worries. Elisa had been through a divorce. She had lost a child to illness shortly after birth and was blamed for it by her then-husband, leading to their divorce. After that, she started working at the foster home and became its director. She was the one who named me Emily. She told me she saw her lost child in me and raised me with a mother's love. But she was struggling with how to deal with me, her non-biological but emotional daughter. One day, Elisa came to me who was living a reckless life and skipping school and suddenly started crying. Even if we're not related by blood, you're my child. All the kids here are precious, but I'm only human and I have special feelings for you, she said through her tears. For some reason, I felt both sad and relieved. I hugged Elisa tightly while crying loudly. As an adult, I realized I was crying out of happiness thinking someone needed me. From that day on, I started helping Elisa actively and began calling her mom. Eventually, I graduated from middle school and started working at the foster home. I was hired by Elisa, who is my mom, to become a social worker. I studied hard through correspondence school and earned my certification. Part of the reason I wanted to work at the foster home was that I believed Ryan and Olivia would come to see me someday. We ordered food supplies for the foster home from a local supermarket, and the delivery guy turned out to be the man I'd later marry. We started with casual conversations every day, but when I found out we liked the same musician, I felt an instant connection. From there, our conversations flowed more naturally, and we grew closer. Eventually, he asked me out on a date. My mom also told me to go, so I headed out on my first date. Since it was my first date experience at the age of 21, I was so nervous that I couldn't speak normally after a few dates. He confessed his feelings on our fifth outing and we started dating. When I told mom, she said, finally, Emily has a boyfriend. It's about time. I felt a bit lonely, though blessed our relationship with a smile. Our relationship progressed smoothly. One of our best memories was going to a concert of our favorite artist after preparing dinner at the foster home. On the way back from the concert, he proposed to me. I was overjoyed and immediately told mom, who tearfully and joyfully gave her consent. Her words about having a family stuck with me, and I vowed to love my family forever. At that time, I was 23, and he was 35. His parents were thrilled about our marriage. Even when I told them I was raised in a foster home and didn't know my biological parents, they said it wasn't a problem. He's an only child, but his parents just wanted us to have a happy family. I decided to cherish my future in-laws as well because they were part of my new family. 
This is because I realized that they are a part of my family, including my in-laws. Soon after we got married, I quit my job and left the foster home as my husband suggested. I was a bit worried about leaving mom to run the foster home alone, but she assured me it would be fine if she was hiring cooking staff. Soon after, I became pregnant. The thought of our precious child growing inside me filled me with immense happiness. But contrary to my joy, my once kind husband began to change. He showed no concern for my morning sickness and even called me dirty. He started eating out instead of having meals at home. When my in-laws found out about my struggles with morning sickness, they brought over some home-cooked meals. My husband wasn't home, so they asked me why I thought it was normal for husbands to eat out during their wife's morning sickness. So I told them without any ill intentions. Upon hearing this, my in-law stayed until my husband returned and scolded him for his behavior. He made some excuses but eventually apologized to me. The importance of family remained a constant theme. I got yelled at by my in-laws because I spoke about why my husband wasn't around. When I said, I'm sorry, I thought this was normal life, so I didn't mean any harm. I was shouted at with no excuses. I got scared of my husband's anger and instinctively protected my belly. The next day, my husband was back to his sweet self. He sincerely apologized and said, once your morning sickness is over, we'll eat at home. Until then, let's eat out. From then on, I started keeping a diary. I wrote about my baby's condition and my family every day. Conversations with my husband, who often came home late, became scarce. The morning sickness was bad, and I felt lonely and anxious. But even then, I thought it was easier than when I was separated from Ryan and Olivia. Yes, that separation was the hardest thing in my life, so nothing could be worse. Even after the morning sickness ended, my husband didn't come home early. And when he did, I could smell sweet perfume. When I asked him, you smell nice, did you meet someone? He seemed surprised for a moment, then angrily said, who I meet is none of your business. I didn't want to argue, so I didn't ask further. Even though I'm not savvy about social norms, I suspected he was cheating. I had no one to talk to, so I wrote in my diary as usual, but his betrayal was shocking. I kept quiet because I didn't want to upset him further. Our child was born safely and it was a boy. My husband was thrilled. We named him Jackson. Apparently, my husband had decided on this name long ago, so he didn't consult me. Baby Jackson looked just like his father. Even my in-law said, he looks just like Robert when he was a baby. I decided to love and never let go of the child I gave birth to. So I never complained. Even when I couldn't sleep due to night feedings, my son was the light of my life, and I understood what that meant. My mom said I should come back home after giving birth, but my husband wouldn't allow it because he'd struggle with housework. So I did all the shopping and housework after I was discharged. I could do it because it's what my family wanted. At first, Jackson was attached to me. But as he grew, he became more attached to his father. He started saying, I'll tell dad whenever I said something. When I asked, what will happen if you tell dad? He said, dad will get mad at you. I couldn't say anything because my husband didn't want me disciplining Jackson. He said, someone not raised by their biological parents can't discipline. So I tried to gently talk to Jackson instead of scolding him when my husband wasn't around. Jackson was a sweet child who followed me around, but things changed when he entered middle school. He started taking money from my wallet. When I asked, Jackson, did you take money from my wallet? He said, it's okay, it's his money. Dad told me to take it from you, Jackson replied. I said, taking it from my wallet without asking is different from being given it, don't you think? He just said, 
Either way, it ends up in my hand and walked away. At dinner, my husband and son were eating and chatting. Jackson told his dad that I scolded him for taking money from my wallet. Hearing this, my husband started complaining to me, How dare you? A high school dropout raised in foster care interfere. I'm the one disciplining Jackson. I said, I just told him it's not okay to take money without asking. My husband told Jackson, it's fine at home, but never take from other people's wallets. Jackson said, I know that, Dad, smiling. My husband praised him. That's my boy, you get it. From then on, both lectured me, saying, Don't interfere with what we're doing. You're just a foster kid with limited education. I wondered, is it okay for family to just take money like that? But I kept quiet, not wanting to upset them. One day I went to visit the foster home with my mom. She was delighted to see me. We had a good chat as the kids were at school or daycare. Mom said, Let's go buy mobile phones today, one for you too. I didn't know what a mobile phone was as I never watched TV. But when mom explained, even I who lacked material desires wanted one. The idea of connecting to the world was appealing. I felt awkward about her buying it. But when we went to the store, we got free models with a plan. Mom offered to pay, but I thought I should find a way to pay her back. I asked my husband if I could get a part-time job, but he said, it's embarrassing for someone like you to work. So I thought about how to make money at home. I kept the phone off and hidden when the family was around. When they were out, I turned it on and researched ways to earn money from home. I learned about blogging for income and chose that path. I thought it was perfect. I could use my free time and my husband wouldn't find out. I started reading various blogs to learn more. And finally, I started my own blog titled, Grew Up in Foster Care with Limited Education, Nave Musings. I wrote about my life experiences. Gradually, my followers increased and I started receiving comments. In five years, I had 20,000 followers and started earning money. My days became fulfilling, but as my blog shifted to my married life, the comments increased, saying my husband's thinking was wrong. I felt sad that my writing seemed like complaints about my husband. I apologized on my blog, saying he's a reasonable person, and it was my poor writing that caused the misunderstanding. The comments on my blog increased even more after that post. Comments like, you're brainwashed. And Emily, you're not wrong, started appearing. I was confused and began to consider quitting the blog to avoid disparaging my husband. Just then, I received a private message on my blog that nearly stopped my heart. It was from someone named Ryan. The message read, Emily, it's Ryan. Do you remember me? Olivia is doing well, too, and included a contact number. I called the number, and when I confirmed it was indeed Ryan, I broke down in tears of joy. Ryan and Olivia had been living overseas after being adopted by a cousin. They hadn't contacted me because they didn't want to bring up painful memories. Recently, Olivia discovered my blog and suspected it was me. Ryan read it too, saw their names, and reached out. He apologized for not contacting me sooner and thanked me for the love I'd shown them in my blog. I truly felt that starting a blog was a good thing. I met Ryan and Olivia at the foster home where my mom works. I thanked my mom for the phone that led to my blog income and told her Ryan and Olivia were coming. She was thrilled. Now that I had an income, I switched the phone bill to my account. I set up my mom's phone so she could easily read my blog and headed home. I got home a bit late, and Jackson, now twenty and commuting to college, was already there. As soon as I walked in, he demanded, give me two hundred dollars. I didn't have it on me, so I refused and he started yelling and throwing a fit. 
Scared, I headed for the kitchen. On the way, I saw my wallet tossed on the floor, emptied of cash. I remembered the blog comment, Emily, you're not wrong, and I began to think that maybe it's not okay for a child to take a parent's money. My husband came home and was shocked at the state of the house. I told him honestly that Jackson had thrown a fit because I didn't give him money. He yelled, it's not your money, it's mine. If Jackson needs it, just give it to him. You have no right to it, you parasite. I finally asked a question that had been on my mind. Why did you marry me? He said, everyone else was getting married and I thought you'd be submissive. Just that. I asked, what else could there be? He said, you think you're attractive. If you have a problem, leave. Go back to the director of the children's home, who isn't even your birth mother. I don't need this boring home life, and stormed out, telling me to clean up. I couldn't sleep a wink last night. Neither my husband nor Jackson came home. I grabbed my phone from the dresser and turned it on. Emails from Mom, Ryan, and Olivia were waiting for me. They sent to meet at the Child Protective Services office today. Multiple emails with the same message made it clear this was urgent. I clenched my phone and rushed to the Child Protective Services office. When I got there, only Mom was present, having just sent the kids off. She looked shocked at my tear-streaked face. Then Ryan and Olivia walked in. Both looked just like I remembered. They hugged me and I felt warm. Then the tears just wouldn't stop. Ryan and Olivia were crying too. Mom joined in, hugging us all and crying. After a while, we started talking. Ryan broke the ice. I read your blog. Is that story true? He asked. I nodded. Then my mother also spoke. Have you been living in shame? I raised you to be a daughter I could be proud of anywhere. What about your parenting? What qualifications did you study so hard for? She seemed angry but was crying. Ryan said, if that blog is true, the problem is with Emily's husband. Marriage is a partnership. Why can't Emily speak her mind? His fist was shaking. Olivia added, didn't you read the comments? Why don't you listen to them? What's written there is common sense. They all gently scolded me. Maybe I was wrong, but for 20 years, I truly loved my husband and Jackson, and it was hard to change how I felt. Mom sensed this and asked, Emily, do you know how much we love you? I do. You always put me before yourselves. I thought I was doing the same for my husband and Jackson. I said, I believe that true love meant sacrificing myself, but Mom shook her head, that's not it. I'm very happy I get happiness from you, but are you really, truly happy now? I don't think you're happy if only your husband and child are. I thought in silence. I knew Mom and Ryan and Olivia loved me. They never pushed me away. They always listened and accepted what I said, and they were genuinely concerned for my happiness. Now, what about my husband and Jackson? Had I ever felt love from them? The more I thought, the more I realized I hadn't. But then I remembered Jackson's smile when he was little, and it broke my heart. Jackson was adorable. He used to look at me with a smile. That Jackson is gone now. I told them about what happened yesterday. Mom said, You can't sever the ties with your child. Even if you divorce, your only child is Jackson. I also told them what my husband had said. When I asked him why, Mom took my hand and said, Your husband told you to leave, right? Then, Emily, come home. It's what he wants, isn't it? You can do that. I think she was leveraging my misguided belief that what my family says is for the best, a belief almost akin to brainwashing. So I thought it would be better for the family if I got divorced. Even facing the prospect of leaving my family, I realized it didn't hurt as much as when I had to part with Ryan and Olivia. 
I went home and said to my husband and Jackson, Let's get divorced. I'll be the one to leave. Just as I suspected, my husband and Jackson were thrilled. Good riddance to the parasite. Awesome lucky us. Seeing their joy, I was convinced that I was neither needed nor loved by them. I thought this was for the best, got their signatures on the divorce papers, and left the house with my few belongings. On the way to the Child Protective Services office, I strangely didn't feel sad. It felt like everyone got what they wanted. I returned to what I could call my original home, the Child Protective Services office. I had a small income from my blog, and I started helping mom while thinking about the future, especially since the facility was facing financial difficulties. One day, Ryan and Olivia came to the facility. They brought me a book publishing offer. They had become executives in a publishing company. The people who adopted them were relatives of Brian and Olivia's father who had refused to take them in. These relatives had vowed to adopt Ryan and Olivia once they were financially stable, and they did. They turned around a failing publishing company and grew it significantly. Ryan and Olivia had shown my blog to the company's CEO, who found it interesting and wanted to publish it. I was hesitant because I didn't have much education and wasn't confident in my writing, but they assured me an editor would help. So I agreed. From there, Rian, Olivia, the editor, and I had several meetings and published the book. My book grew up in foster care with limited education. Nave Musings caught the media's attention thanks to the publishing company and my followers, and it became a bestseller. I started getting interview requests from the media. I was hesitant due to my shyness, but Ryan and the others encouraged me, so I agreed. Appearing on TV made my ex-husband and Jackson aware of my book. My ex-husband called the Child Protective Services office where I was. When I answered, he said, How are you? I heard your book is selling well. If I'd known you could make money like this, I wouldn't have divorced you. I stayed silent. How about we live together again? We could even remarry, he added. Still, I said nothing. Assuming I was in a bad mood, he handed the phone to Jackson. Mom, I miss you. I want to live with you again. I want to eat your cooking. They both seem to have changed their tune. I asked Jackson, did you read my book? He said he hadn't. So I asked him to ask his father if he had read it. Turns out neither had. I said, read the book. Once you do, you won't be able to make calls like this and hung up. A few days later, it seemed they started getting cold stares from neighbors, co-workers, and classmates. Even without reading the book in a panic, they bought and read the book, realizing it candidly depicted what they had done to me. Since then, I've heard nothing from my ex-husband or Jackson. My ex-husband reportedly won't forgive me for making him feel small. Jackson, who was dumped by his girlfriend and felt down, was talked sense into by a friend. He said, I'll show mom that I've changed and earn her forgiveness and decided to quit college to become a licensed clinical psychologist. He says he wants to provide mental care for children at this Child Protective Services facility. If I ever forgive him. I believe people don't change easily, but part of me is waiting for that day. Since he's my child, I've come to think that blood ties don't matter. If you're connected by the heart, you can become a family, even if you're not related.